Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the Mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. For today's topic, which is uh, staying mobile, uh, it refers to staying physically active. Uh, if you see a toddler, the a toddler is all the time moving around. It's difficult to keep it still. It's always mobile. But by the time this child grows up to be 20, uh, you have to tell the child to move sometimes. You know, these days, uh, uh, the children get so stuck, so glued to their desk and chair. And uh, uh, with all the encouragement from uh, the parents and the society to study as long as they can so they can clear all the entrance exams. Uh, and uh, whatever little diversion they have is also you know, sitting on the desk using their smartphones. One has to force the child to move around a bit. And uh, the child may look upon it as uh, a punishment because by the time the person is 20, uh, he has also gone through school where sometimes exercise is portrayed as a punishment. As a younger child, the child looked upon games as mere entertainment. He did not uh, think about their value as exercise. He was just enjoying them because he enjoyed playing. When it comes to just physical activity like running, the school uh, portrayed it as a sort of a punishment. Uh, one of the punishments could be in schools uh, to go around the play field running five times. Take five rounds of the play field running. Uh, that's a punishment. So the result is that uh, by the time the child has grown up to an age where uh, uh, he has willingly sacrificed all games for the sake of studies and uh, exercise per se, which can be taken in a much shorter time. You know, games take a lot time, a lot more time compared to uh, the exercise that they give. So he can get a plenty of exercise in much less time if he just takes ordinary exercise like say jogging. But then uh, by then he has come to look upon that as some sort of a punishment. And the result is that uh, uh, we tend to grow sedentary and uh, pay a price for it. So this uh, session is essentially about the necessity for staying mobile throughout life for the sake of staying healthy. And of course, in yoga, staying healthy is not an end in itself. Staying healthy is a means to a higher end. Staying healthy so that this instrument that we have, the body-mind complex, can stay in good shape and uh, can be used for the purpose for which it has been brought into this world, that is, uh, for the onward journey of the soul, so that uh, uh, we make good use of this life and that onward journey of the soul, uh, spiritual progress in this life, in this world, depends upon how much we are able to share through love with our fellow beings. That means the key sort of to it. So uh, living a life full of love, which then automatically becomes as a byproduct, also a life which is full of joy, peace, fulfillment, and of course, good health. All these are the byproducts of that life well lived, a life lived meaningfully. And one of the important uh, aspects of that is staying physically active, which we shall concentrate on today. So with that background, uh, let's now turn to the slides. Now, there are various types of exercise. Now, one is the type that is unavoidable. And that is a part of everyday work. And uh, for some people, that may be almost negligible. But then uh, there are many for whom this is a part of everyday work, like say walking to work or at least walking part of the way to work, back from work, at the workplace, climbing stairs, uh, or as a part of daily work, uh, doing some manual work. So all that is unavoidable. It's a part of our everyday work. It also contributes to physical activity. But at the same time, that is not what we are talking about today. We are talking about voluntary exercise, that is exercise that is undertaken willfully, uh, which is structured into our daily routine deliberately. And uh, that also is important, apart from 
this unavoidable exercise, which is a part of everyday work for various reasons, because uh, that exercise, which is a part of everyday work, uh, may be very selective, may affect only some parts of the body, and uh, uh, may not be that enjoyable all the time, and uh, so on. So uh, that cannot be really uh, depended upon entirely. It does help. Uh, as compared to those who are in a very sedentary occupation. It does help those who are in a, an occupation that uh, involves physical activity, but all the same, that cannot be a substitute for a certain minimum amount of exercise, which is deliberately built into the daily routine or the voluntary exercise. And of course, if in the daily work, we do not have any opportunity for exercise, then sometimes it's good, in fact, to find an excuse for it because some physical activity is better than no physical activity at all. For example, uh, uh, if one has the choice between the staircase and the lift or the elevator, it's better to take the staircase. And uh, if uh, uh, we have the choice of uh, uh, using uh, the car all the way to work or uh, traveling part of the way by the, uh, the metro or the underground uh, and leaving the car a uh, little distance away from the metro station, uh, then... Uh, that will again involve some compulsory walking. So one can always uh, uh, try and find an excuse for uh, exercise, even in uh, even as a part of our daily work. But uh, what we shall focus on today is exercise, which is voluntarily or deliberately structured into our daily routine. This may be uh, primarily from uh, the purpose of this primarily maybe recreational. Uh, for example, games, or it may be seriously undertaken for the sake of uh, good health and structured into our daily routine. For example, jogging, cycling, sw swimming, uh, walking, gymming. Uh, all these may be enjoyed, but uh, what certainly can be enjoyed in the same category are yogic postures. Okay, what I'm saying, uh, sometimes the uh, other types of exercises may be enjoyable and sometimes not. Because if they're taken very seriously for the sake of good health, for the sake of uh, 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 escaping, talking the other day, that if someone has to do something, it doesn't uh, give as much benefit as one wants to do it. And if a person wants to do something, only when the person finds it enjoyable. And that is something which is built into the postures if they are properly done. Because postures then fit into a larger in which uh, we are uh, uh, keep in good shape, that becomes a sacred duty that becomes a part of our philosophy of life uh, because it is helping us live the type of life which would be truly meaningful. And in that process, uh, the uh, small, uh, small things which have to be added, like say exercise, they become an enjoyable part of everyday routine so that uh, that is what helps us uh, perform, do uh, what we should be doing in this world for the sake of living a meaningful life. Sometimes activity which starts as an enjoyable activity or, the, or as a recreational activity can turn serious. Uh, so we were on uh, recreational activity, uh, starting as an enjoyable activity, turning serious if we take life too seriously, and get obsessed with it, we again get anxious about it. Another way it can get very serious is if uh, a person is very good at a certain uh, type of game uh, and enters the field of competitive sports, then it becomes a profession. Then uh, uh, to achieve a degree of excellence for the sake of uh, 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 staying on the top, make, turns it again into a very serious affair and loses all its enjoyable element. But what we shall concentrate on is primarily the average person who wants to take, wants to be physically active for the sake of staying healthy and staying physically fit. So uh, why exercise? The question is why not? Because exercise can be enjoyable. And uh, coming to more concrete reasons why one should exercise is that it improves the reserve capacity of the heart and lungs. The entire body, you know, has a plenty of reserve, uh, which is uh, to 
help us cope with the extra demands, for example, during exercise, as well as as a reserve which can be encroached upon in disease. Because uh, if the disease affects the function of that organ, it may not be felt because that still leaves enough of function in the organ to take care of our resting requirements, ordinary requirements. And it's only during excessive demand that the, uh, that the person may feel that something has happened. But otherwise, uh, that reserve capacity takes care of that. Now, while we have a certain inbuilt reserve, if we remain physically active, the reserve capacity, particularly of the heart and lungs, improves. On the other hand, if the person becomes sedentary, gradually this reserve capacity can also diminish. That's a general principle. If we use any function of the body regularly, then it improves. If we stop using it, it uh, deteriorates, uh, what we call disuse atrophy. Not using it itself makes it uh, weaker. So we strengthen any function in the body by making use of it. And since we are not using the reserve capacity all the time, Encroaching on some of this reserve during exercise helps in, in helps in enhancing this reserve capacity. Now, one of the things that happens as a part of aging is that uh, gradually this reserve keeps reducing because the, or, the function of every organ is undergoing some sort of a decline with age and therefore the reserve keeps falling. If exercise improves the reserve capacity, it means it does just the opposite of what happens as a result of the aging process. And therefore, uh, the aging process itself seems to slow down uh, as a result of this uh, exercise. Uh, for example, uh, when I was about 65, uh, I had some pain in the neck which went on for quite a few weeks and I got an X-ray done. Now, when the doctor looked at this X-ray of the neck, he said, well, there are some age-related changes, cervical spondylotic changes, age-related changes in the neck. Uh, I would pass it off as a normal uh, spine, normal cervical spine, normal spine of the neck region for a 40, 45-year-old. I was 65, which means that uh, aging had happened, but that what, what happens in an average person at age of 45 happened in my case at the age of 65. So it slows down aging. It can't pre prevent aging, but it slows it down. It improves the flexibility of the body. And uh, this comes in handy because uh, we do require a little more flexibility sometimes. And uh, if uh, the body has become too rigid and then uh, in the course of everyday activity, one has to bend a little more or... Uh, do something which requires better flexibility, then one might injure oneself. But uh, exercise keeps us flexible all the time so that uh, injuries become less likely. It improves endurance. Endurance is the duration for which uh, some physical activity can go on. Uh, so it improves the duration for which we can uh, put in physical work. It also improves the bone mineral density. That is uh, the density of uh, uh, calcium salts, which uh, impart hardness to the bone. Uh, uh, that improves. And uh, that's again a part of the function of aging. Uh, as one ages, as one grows older, the bone mineral density goes down. Uh, this also slows down. But then uh, uh, this is something on which you can spend a little more time because when it comes to bone mineral density, there are two aspects to it. One is achieving a good bone mineral density and then retaining it. Because uh, we achieve a certain level of bone mineral density during youth when the bones are growing. And uh, after that, we cannot improve upon it. But as a result of the aging process, if it starts deteriorating. So, Having so both are important, achieving a good level during youth and then slowing down the loss of this density, which happens as a result of aging. And for both, for achieving a high level during youth and for retaining it later, uh, we need a combination of a healthy diet and exercise. In the diet, the most important thing are uh, calcium and vitamin D. Vitamin D, because it helps us in absorbing calcium. So 
both calcium and vitamin D are important in the diet and exercise. This is something which is not commonly realized, but unless there is a regular exercise, uh, there is not that much deposition of the uh, calcium salts in the bones during youth. And what type of exercise? Preferably weight-bearing exercises. Exercise Because you find that the deposition of calcium in the bones is maximum along the lines of force. That is, you know, the uh, those um, uh, lines along which weight is being borne. And uh, that's understandable because that is where greater strength is required in the bones. So uh, the whole mechanism seems to have been designed in such a way that uh, greater deposition will take place where greater strength is needed. And therefore, what is important is during youth is to not only exercise regularly along with the good diet, but also uh, perform exercises which involve weight bearing. A classical example would be weight lifting. But that doesn't mean that everybody has to lift a lot of weight and become a weightlifter. But uh, uh, the important thing is that one should perform some exercises which involve some weight bearing, some work against a resistance. Uh, like uh, if uh, against resistance means, say, uh, pushing something which is difficult to push or uh, lifting something against gravity. Uh, now, that is the type of exercises which can be called uh, weight-bearing exercises. And uh, that type of exercises are best for achieving a good bone mineral density. And then for retaining it, uh, both diet and exercise should continue through the, throughout life. Now, exercise also has an effect on body weight. Uh, it helps us maintain body weight. Those who are overweight, it helps in re reducing and the body weight. And it also has an effect on body composition because it's not just body weight that is important. It's also important how much of this weight is made up of muscles and how much of fat. So exercise helps in tilting the uh, body composition towards greater muscle mass and less of fat. So it's not just important to have a normal body weight. Uh, it should have relatively less fat and more muscle mass. And that's understandable because uh, the muscles that are used for exercise grow healthier, stronger, bigger, uh, fatter. And therefore, those uh, muscles uh, then come to occupy a greater fraction of the body weight. So muscle mass increases and in relation to the fat in the body. So it also has a good positive effect. Exercise has a positive effect on the body composition. That is the muscle mass in relation to the fat mass. Now, when it comes to maintaining body weight or losing weight, which of the two is more important, diet or exercise? It is, in fact, not an either or situation. One should use both. Uh, but at the same time, since this question does occur to us off and on, uh, it's important to emphasize that here, yes, diet is more important. But that doesn't mean exercise is unimportant. Why diet is more important is because when it comes to exercise, you have a relatively narrow range of energy expenditure to play with. Because even a person who is totally at rest consumes at least half as much energy as a person who is moderately physically active. So a certain amount of uh, uh, energy is being spent anyway just for staying alive, even if the person is lying down all the time. And the additional energy that he can spend is limited uh, no matter how hard he exercises. And most people will not be able to exercise very hard and therefore uh, he cannot go beyond that. Whereas when it comes to diet, one can go right from zero, that is uh, fasting, up to a, a higher level for which there seems to be virtually no limit because one can have very palatable calorie-dense foods which take very little effort to eat and one can enjoy them and eat a lot and therefore it can vary from right from zero to 6,000 calories a day. So the range available in the diet to, to us is much more and therefore diet can have a greater effect on body weight than exercise. But all the same, exercise is important because it is not required only for maintaining body weight. It also has many other positive effects, some of which we have seen and some more we shall see as we go along. 
So the role of exercise in maintaining body weight is that firstly it restores energy balance, which means that if there is a small uh, imbalance, that is the intake is a little more than expenditure, then by increasing the expenditure, exercise can help us restore that balance so that uh, now the person, instead of gaining weight, will stop gaining weight because uh, he can continue eating the same amount. So the intake remains the same, but earlier the expenditure was a little less than the intake. Now the expenditure has been increased by exercise, so energy balance can be restored. But then there are other effects which are more subtle, and that is exercise by itself also increases the energy expenditure during the rest of the day. That is not only while the person is exercising, but during the rest of the day also, the resting metabolic rate itself goes up. So the person spends more energy throughout the day if he is physically active. And it helps in improving body composition, which means that uh, all the energy spent on exercise may not be reflected in the body weight, but then it gets reflected in the composition. That is, what is it that this weight is made up of? It will be made up more of uh, muscle mass, less of fat mass, which is all there, uh, which is a very healthy situation. So these are the types of uh, effects uh, which uh, exercise has on body weight. Now this uh, question actually now does not really require much effort to answer. Uh, those who are underweight, should they take in, undertake any exercise at all? Yes, even they should for a variety of reasons. Firstly, exercise is not only for maintaining body weight, it is for many other things. Secondly, even if the person is underweight, uh, he should not only eat more, but also exercise, because exercise by itself uh, uh, will also have an effect on improving the muscle mass, which will also contribute to the weight. It's better to increase the weight by adding muscle mass than by adding fat. So even those who are underweight should take exercise. Now, come, let's see some other reasons why one should take exercise. It has uh, an impact on borderline diabetes. Of course, it uh, helps in all types of diabetes, even severe diabetes. But uh, in borderline diabetes, uh, one finds that uh, even if the person does nothing else, but just becomes regularly physically active, the person's blood glucose levels shift from that borderline level to the normal level. If a person is overweight, the person just loses 5 kilos of weight. Even if the person does not reach normal weight, one finds that the blood glucose levels st start moving from the borderline zone to the normal zone, which means that borderline diabetes uh, can be corrected when it, if one looks at it in terms of the blood glucose levels, it can be corrected just by losing some weight or by becoming physically active and the two go together. Uh, even if the person was not already overweight to start with and has borderline diabetes, even this person, by getting physically more active, will be able to move his blood glucose levels from that borderline zone to the normal zone. And of course, if the person uh, has a higher uh, blood glucose levels, which cannot be corrected in this way, at least it will help in uh, reducing the dose of medication if the person is on medication. Exercise also has an effect on blood cholesterol levels. Again, as in case of diabetes, uh, just losing some weight or becoming physically active, the two going together generally, uh, will help in bringing down total cholesterol levels as well as LDL cholesterol levels. And it also helps in increasing the HDL cholesterol levels. HDL is the so-called good cholesterol. So higher the HDL, the better, and lower the LDL, the better. So uh, it has positive, uh, favorable effects on uh, blood cholesterol levels, the total as well as the fractions, LDL and HDL. Exercise reduces LDL cholesterol and increases the levels of HDL cholesterol. To remember which one of these is to the good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, you can remember L for lousy. Eh? LDL, the lousy part of the cholesterol. And H for healthy, HDL is the healthy part of the cholesterol. So, LDL is bad or lousy, HDL is good or healthy. Is it possible to maintain body weight without exercise? 
yes it is possible to uh, one can uh, um, uh, eat very little and take no exercise the body weight will remain uh, within normal limits for many people but uh, the main aim in uh, for if one has to stay healthy the main thing is not to just uh, maintain body weight the main thing is to be healthy and to be healthy uh, it's not enough uh, to just have a normal body weight as we have seen so many effects or positive effects of exercise all those are important to a person irrespective of the body weight so while it may be possible to maintain the body weight by eating less and exercising less it's better to exercise more and eat more and if one enjoys eating you can understand that also gives you uh, the opportunity to take some liberties and take more of uh, the things which you really enjoy eating so to get that freedom that liberty again it is helpful if a person is physically active you can maintain body weight enjoy your food and uh, uh, both are possible with exercise so while it may be possible to maintain body weight without exercise it's not desirable for some people it may be difficult to lose weight no matter what they do but if they take exercise regularly still it will help them and uh, and that's what has given us the concept these days which is called the fat and fit so some people are designed in such a way that they'll never be able to become completely normal in weight if this uh, but if they remain physically active they can be fat as well as fit exercise has not only these physical and biochemical effects exercise also helps in relieving mental stress and at the biochemical level it probably does so by releasing from in the brain endorphins endorphins are uh, the uh, neurotransmitters which uh, make us feel good and uh, exercise helps in uh, releasing those neurotransmitters in the brain and uh, that is the mechanism underlying mechanism uh, through which the exercise makes us feel good endorphins resemble opium uh, but they don't produce the type of addiction harmful addiction that opium does but all the same they do produce some addiction to exercise which is a favorable thing and that is why if a person takes regular exercise and enjoys it the person starts feeling that he is missing something on those days on which he has missed the exercise because he has got addicted to the exercise and that addiction is possibly also uh, because of the same chemicals which give him in that uh, pleasure during the exercise which makes him which make him feel good during exercise so the same chemicals which make him feel good during exercise also addict him to the exercise which ensures that he'll remain physically active then effects on immunity levels generally speaking exercise also helps in improving immunity levels the person becomes more immunocompetent which means that now the person uh, is less likely to get attacks of common cold etc and uh, of course immunity has wider implications in terms of uh, infectious diseases as well as cancer it can help in preventing all those but then one of the most visible effects of improved immunity levels is that a person who is physically active is less likely to fall ill uh, but even with acute illnesses like common cold etc and the overall effect of exercise can also be looked at in this way that those who are physically active tend to live longer they have a longer life span uh, what's called technically all cause mortality so all cause mortality put together is uh, it shows that the life span is longer in those who that are physically active now looking at all this the expectations from exercise are twofold generally one is good health and the other is physical fitness now the two are not exactly the same because uh, good health means that all parts of the body are able to function properly whereas physical fitness just means that the a person has a good uh, cardio respiratory fitness that is his heart and lungs have achieved a level which is capable of achieving good performance now this physical fitness you know can be understood like this that um, the 
reserve goes up or the higher capacity goes up. For example, normally we breathe at the level, say, at the rate of about, uh, uh, say, 12 times a minute and about half a liter of air we take in and bring out with each breath. So half a liter multiplied by 12 will give us a ventilation, that is the movement of air by the lungs of six liters a minute. On the other hand, if a person tries to uh, breathe as hard and as fast as he can, he can achieve levels of about 100 liters per minute. So normally only about six. Breathing as hard and as fast as one can, about 100 liters a minute. About 94 liters per minute of our capacity is held in reserve. This can further go up in a person who is regularly physically active and can go to 120, 150 liters per minute. On the other hand, if the person is sedentary, that can come down from 100 to say 80 or 70 or 60 liters per minute. Uh, so physical fitness means that this reserve has gone up from the average of about 100. Now this person, as a result of regular physical activity, structured, deliberate physical activity undertaken with the idea of becoming more fit, has been raise it, able to raise it from 100 to 120 or 150. And therefore, now this person can take even more strenuous exercise without getting out of breath. In the same way, in case of the heart, normally when we are at rest, say the resting heart rate is about 70, and with each beat, the heart pumps 70 milliliters of blood. So 70 multiplied by 70 gives us about 5 liters of blood is pumped every minute by each ventricle. So 5 liters per minute. In an average person, uh, if the person takes exercise, he can take this up from 5 to about 25 liters per minute. But then if he is, uh, undertakes regular physical activity with the idea of getting more physically fit, a structured program and so on, then he can achieve levels of almost 50 liters per minute. So he can raise his, so instead of uh, being at rest, it remains the same, the requirements remain the same. So he pumps five liters per minute. But whereas during exercise, an average person can reach a maximum level of about 25 liters of blood pumped per minute this person can pump as much as 50 liters per minute, which means through both the function of improvement in the function of the heart and the respiratory system, now this person is capable of undertaking much more strenuous exercise for longer periods of time, so the person has become physically more fit. But that does not necessarily mean that the person has become more healthy. It may be expected to, but then very often that does not happen unless attention is paid to all aspects of health. So the person may not have become healthy, but as a result of this structured program, he has just become physically more fit. Now, this comes out in the sports paradox, the conflict between health and fitness. You know, sometimes some people take to the gym and things like that because uh, it's trendy and people think that uh, being physically active is important. They undertake very strenuous exercises there or there are professional um, Sports persons uh, who have no choice to stay on top, they have to be physically extremely active and therefore they build up very good levels of physical fitness. But then sometimes while jogging or while in the gym, they collapse. Why that happens is because uh, there's a price to be paid for the capacity of the heart to pump more blood. In an average person, it pumps a maximum of 25 liters per minute. This person's heart can pump up to 50 liters per minute. But then how? His, the walls of his ventricles have become thicker. Now his muscles have become thicker. And this thicker muscle wall in the heart also needs a greater blood flow. Now, the person has not become more healthy. His blood vessels are getting clogged with fatty deposits, as it happens in most people who get older and the, the less healthy the person, more these fatty deposits are likely to be there. So this person is not paying attention to health as a whole. And the result is that his arteries are getting clogged. Now these clogged arteries may be quite still able to deliver enough blood to the heart for resting levels. They may be able to also deliver enough blood uh, during exercise to a person whose muscle wall is not very thick. But in this person who undertakes maximal exercise, and whose heart requires greater blood flow because of the greater muscle thickness, the super performance which he has achieved is because of this greater thickness of the walls, which can contract more strongly. 
Now, this person cannot, uh, uh, it does not, uh, in this case, if the arteries are clogged, what happens is that one day when he's putting in his maximum effort, which he's capable of because of this thicker heart muscle, these blocked arteries are unable to deliver enough blood to the heart to meet this uh, heavy requirement of the heart for blood because of a thicker wall and because of contracting much more strongly than it would in an average person even during exercise. So here there is a super performance by a super heart, but which does not have sufficient food supply. No, blood supply is like food supply for the heart. It is not getting enough. So you are squeezing a very hard working heart, otherwise a very capable heart. You are starving it at the very time when it needs that blood flow the most. And the result is because of this discrepancy between the demand and the supply, the demand is high, the supply is not enough because of the clogged arteries, the person just collapses. So this person is physically very fit, but otherwise unhealthy. So that's the conflict. So that's why it's important to firstly understand this and pay to attention to all aspects of health, not just sort of go on taking more and more exercise in the gym and be happy that now I can do this much as I could do only this much. That is not enough. It's better to pay attention to health as a whole. Of course, uh, while most of us would be happy to have just good health and good physical fitness, some people expect also from exercise specific skills, those who are in competitive sports, and some of them would like to develop endurance so that they can run a long race, like a marathon, and some would like to improve in, say, a sprint. Now, the skills require different types of training programs. The training is not the same for all these. The training depends upon, the training program depends upon the type of skills to be developed. And uh, that doesn't mean that any uh, person who uh, goes through that training program will develop better skills in that area. Because to some extent, our suitability for a particular type of sports is also genetically determined. And therefore, it's better to find out what that person is best suited for, what type of sports that person is suited for, and then go undergo training for that type of a program. Then the person is more likely to reach the peak, reach the summit, become a top performer in competitive sports. Because uh, then you have matched the genetic potential with the specific type of training program for that developing that type of skills. How frequently should the exercise be taken? At least five days a week and the person should enjoy it. If the person truly enjoys it, it is more likely to become seven days a week because the person will start missing the exercise on the days on which he's unable to do it. He's addicted. For health and fitness, that is the major two needs which most of us have. Uh, aerobic exercises are the best, like walking, long distance running, yogic postures. For specific exercise skills, it has to be a tailor-made program and it may consist of aerobic exercise for say, a long race and it may be anaerobic exercise for a sprint. Uh, but turning to what most of us are interested then that is health and fitness. Aerobic. aerobic means that the additional demand for oxygen can be met during the exercise itself. The body needs more oxygen during uh, exercise as compared to the resting state. This additional need can be met with during the exercise itself by improve by in enhancing by stepping up the function of the lungs and the heart. So that is aerobic. That is not possible, firstly, because the requirement is very heavy. It's a heavy exercise, so all that ad additional ex oxygen cannot be uh, taken in. But uh, not only that, the duration is very short, so the body doesn't get enough time 
to develop its peak oxygen delivery to the muscles. So the result is that the person does not meet the entire requirement for the exercise during the exercise. The, the person incurs what is called an oxygen debt. And this debt is repaid back when the person stops the exercise. That is why after a sprint for quite some time, the person will continue to breathe very fast and the heart will continue to beat fast. That happens because the person is now taking in additional oxygen to pay off the debt that was incurred during the exercise. So that is an anaerobic exercise. So, but for practical purposes, most of us find it suitable to go in for an aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise during which in which the oxy additional oxygen demand is met during the exercise itself. And this category come walking, long distance running and yogic postures. Now, turning to yogic postures a bit, how they are better than other aerobic exercises, the asanas involve only slow, gentle, and conscious movements. Conscious part is important because that helps in uh, connecting the body and the mind and also re reduces the chances of injury. The person knows that if I go beyond this point, I might injure myself. And therefore, instead of... Uh, trying to indulge in bravado, holds the posture there. Then, you know, in asanas, the stretch keeps alternating with relaxation. There's a relaxation built in between the postures. There's a relaxation at the end and each pose is followed by a counter pose. Pose and counter pose means, you know, in a pose, if there is a movement in one direction, in the next posture, it is in just the opposite direction so that the stretch of this posture is neutralized by the stretch of this posture, so because it is in the opposite direction. Now, all these things put together, slow, gentle, and conscious movements, stretching, alternating with relaxation, relaxation between the postures, relaxation at the end of the session, and pose followed by counter pose, means that at the end of the session, the person is relaxed, not exhausted. As Sri Aurobindo said, you know about the asanas, the experience in the practice of asana is not that of a cessation and diminution of energy by inertia. It's not exhaustion, but of a great increase in pouring circulation of force, of the pranic force, of the pranic energy. And uh, these conscious movements also means, and slow and gentle movements also means injury is very unlikely. And Another, other, some other practical benefits of asanas are that even if a person has an injury somewhere or has pain in some part of the body, uh, a few postures are still always possible. The person can do those postures which uh, uh, involve other parts of the body because if one person does all of them, it gives a top-to-toe workout, which many other sports may not. But then a few postures are possible even if some part of the body cannot be moved because of pain or maybe arthritis or whatever. Then they can be done at home. So one doesn't have to spend time on commuting. And since they can be done at home, they can be done in any dress and in any weather. Extremes of heat, cold, rain, etc. don't matter and without any equipment. The priorities in the asanas are firstly to improve the capacity of the body to relax, particularly the muscles to relax. Secondly, to improve the flexibility of the body. And thirdly, to improve muscle strength in that order. So asanas is not really primarily meant improving muscle strength. It's better to do both. Start with yogic postures and then later during the day, uh, do something which can improve muscle strength. Uh, the reason is that uh, even in those uh, exercises, those type of programs which are designed for improving muscle strength, unless the muscles can relax and unless the body is flexible, there's a great chance of injury. So one will be able to avoid injury in those practices which are designed to improve muscle strength by making the body capable of relaxation and more flexible through yogic postures. So the asana, what the asanas don't do by themselves is, firstly, they are not the best for losing weight. 
because uh, uh, they do not consume too much energy. But all the same, if one looks at yoga as a whole, by reducing the need for the of the person for uh, uh, food on for need for the person of being dependent on food for his happiness, the person being able to overcome greed easily. For that reason, the person will be uh, not only uh, spending some energy on the postures, but also eating less and doing both the things happily. And therefore, the person can lose weight. But all the same, asanas by themselves are not the best for losing weight. For that, a person can add some exercise which consumes more energy, the yogic postures. Or make the yogic postures themselves more dynamic. That is, instead of just holding the posture, make them a little more repetitive, spend more time on practices like Surya Namaskar, unless the person cannot do them due to health reasons. For next, what the asanas don't do, we although it is said quite often, and that's why I put it there, they do not cure diabetes or hypothyroidism, and they are not a panacea for all types of diseases. All types of incredible claims are made uh, to attract people to uh, different uh, establishments are teaching yogic postures, but uh, these claims don't generally stand proper scrutiny because, uh, and the reasons why they claim these are also completely ridiculous. It will cure diabetes because it can really, because this particular, these six postures will release insulin from your pancreas. We have measured insulin levels in blood after those postures, the insulin levels don't go up firstly. Secondly, the pancreas is not like a bag which you can just squeeze and release insulin. Thirdly, insulin is not just something which you have to release into the blood once a day by taking those postures. The person is taking, doing those postures in a fasting state, on an empty stomach. If that is the time when you were to squeeze that bag and release insulin, the person's blood sugar will fall to levels below normal. The person will go into hypoglycemia. Thank God that insulin is not released like that by squeezing the pancreas, by squeezing the abdomen. Otherwise, the person will faint because of hypoglycemia. What the exercise, the way any exercise, including yogic postures, help is in more subtle ways. They improve the sensitivity of the body to insulin. They improve the movement of the glucose into muscles while the muscles are exercising. That is what the exercise does. When the muscles exercise, they need more glucose and they need to utilize more glucose. So that is the time the muscles need more uh, uh, insulin and they uh, need more glucose and insulin helps in moving more glucose into the muscles at that time. So these are the type of subtle effects that, uh, insulin, that exercise has in general on diabetes. So it helps diabetes. It can help... Uh, in diabetes. It can reduce the dose of medication in severe diabetes, but it is not a cure for diabetes. In the same way you can't squeeze the thyroid uh, and release thyroxine once a day just by bending the neck in Sarvangasana. That's again equally ridiculous. So uh, these are incredible claims and uh, don't stand scrutiny. You will be cured. They don't even understand what the word cure means. The difference between treating a disease, managing a disease, and curing a disease. Curing means that now the person is back to normal health. Um, a 50-year-old has just become as healthy as he was at 25. That is neither possible nor necessarily uh, something which one can, needs to aim at. So it's not a cure for any disease. So these are some of the things which asanas don't do. So to sum up, which exercise? For health and fitness, which is all which what most of us are interested in, what we need is aerobic training and yogic postures. Yogic postures score in so many ways over other types of exercise like walking and long distance running. But having said that, any exercise is better than no exercise, exercise at all, number one. And number two, even walking or jogging undertaken with the yogic attitude can become a part of yoga. On the other hand, even yogic postures undertaken without that attitude remain just physical activity. They don't become yoga.
The next question arises is how long should one take exercise? About 30 minutes of walking or its equivalent plus warm up and cooling down time. Now that is as a rule of the thumb. Enough for staying healthy. Uh, you with postures fall in the same category because in every session involves about 30 minutes of uh, activity plus about 10 minutes of warm-up plus 10 minutes of cooling down comes to about an hour. So all this put together means about an hour of exercise a day uh, made up of about 30 minutes of physical activity plus some time spent on warm-up and some on cooling down after the exercise. person who is regularly active. If a person is starting physical activity after years of sedentary life, hasten slowly, build up slowly. And uh, if the person has a disease already like high blood pressure, heart disease, or then one needs to consult the doctor because he may require further limitation of exercise. And modifying postures, some modifications may be necessary to make them easier or less risky. Now comes the next question. Easy to answer. Uh, but uh, the general principle of how intense the exercise should be is that it should be hard enough to be challenging. That's how the person will be able to move beyond the level at which he now is. Uh, and that helps in building up at the physical level alternative channels of circulation in the heart, that is collaterals, which will uh, keep compensating for the blockage, which to some extent may be inevitable as a part of the aging process, but the person will not even come to know about it because on one hand, that process is happening slowly, the clogging of the arteries is happening slowly because of his healthy lifestyle. On the other hand, uh, because of this challenging, a little challenge that he's posing every day during exercise, these alternative, uh, there's a stimulus for development of the collaterals, that is alternative routes of circulation in the blood, of blood in the heart. So it should be hard enough to be challenging, but yet not so hard as to be risky, not raise the demands of the heart to such a level that uh, now it's impossible to keep up with the supply. That will come risky. So that is the general principle. But then how do we actually know when that level of exercise, which is hard enough to be challenging, but yet safe, has been reached. Now we'll go over it bit by bit. Uh, one way of looking at it is that um, the person uh, should not reach a very high level of the heart rate. Uh, because, you know, now at rest we have a certain heart rate. During exercise, we, the heart rate goes up. And it can go up to a certain peak in every individual. Um, the maximum heart rate that can be achieved in an individual depends upon age. And as a rule of the thumb, the maximum heart rate possible during exercise is 220 minus age. Heart rate is a bit like, you know, in the rate at which while walking, the rate at which one takes the steps. So you can take steps faster but then you can go only up to a point. In the same way, in case of the maximum heart rate also, one can go only up to a point. And the maximum heart rate in a person is, roughly speaking, 220 minus age. So if a person is 50 year old, then the maximum heart rate is 220 minus 50, that is 170. But the person actually should not reach that maximum heart rate during exercise. Exercise will not be safe at that heart rate, which means the person should stop at a level of exercise which is well below this maximum heart rate. And this level, which is well below the maximum heart rate is what is called the target heart rate. That is the level at which he should aim so that the exercise is sufficiently challenging to be effective, to be helpful in getting healthy, become staying healthy and getting healthier. Uh, so he should reach only the target heart rate. How much should this target heart rate be? It should be 45 to 80% of the maximum heart rate. In what percentage it should be in an individual that the doctor can decide depending upon the health of the individual. 
Now let's apply this to an arterial case. Suppose there's a man age 50, his maximum heart rate is 170. The person should not reach it during exercise. And suppose the doctor prescribes in this case that the target is 60% of the maximum heart rate. Now, 60% of this maximum heart rate, that's 170, will be 102, which means this person should undertake a physical activity in which his maximum heart rate achieved, that is the peak during the at the end of that vigorous exercise or whatever he's undertaking, uh, towards the end of this exercise, still he has reached a level of not more than 102. Now, let's see, applying this formula to another situation. A man age 60. Now, his maximum heart rate is 220 minus 60, that is 160. Suppose he's prescribed a target heart rate which is 50% of his maximum heart rate. So, he's told that uh, you're, during exercise, you should not exceed 80. Now, if his resting heart rate is 70, he cannot exercise at all. So that is ridiculous. Now, this type of a ridiculous situation does not arise uh, if the person uh, uses another formula which improves upon this. This formula is called the Kavanen equation. Kavanen, after the uh, Finnish physician who came up with this formula, Finnish, you know, means a, a physician from Finland. Uh, his, uh, say in this case, 60 year old, his maximum heart rate is 160, his resting heart rate is 70. So the, he means that he's holding in reserve the capacity to make the heart beat by 90 beats per minute. So his heart rate reserve is 160 minus 70, 90 beats per minute. Now he's prescribed a, a percentage, not of the maximum heart rate, but of the heart rate reserve. So if he's prescribed exercise at the level of 50% of the heart rate reserve, heart rate reserve is 90. So that comes to 45. With that we add the resting heart rate, that is 70. That gives us a target heart rate of 115. So this, since we are adding the resting heart rate, well, the reserve that he, per certain percentage of the reserve, it, it will always be more than the resting heart rate. So the resting heart rate will be, uh, because resting heart rate is getting added to something, it will be always more than the resting heart rate. And therefore, the person uh, can aim at that heart rate. Now, what is this target heart rate? It is the maximum heart rate that may be reached at the end of the exercise. And therefore, the, since one can't measure it during the exercise, the pulse should be counted as soon as possible at the end of the exercise. And for how long? You know, after exercise, the heart rate starts falling. And therefore, it should be counted immediately at the end of the exercise and for a very short period. Because if one counts for a full minute, by the end of the minute, the heart rate would have dropped considerably. So one may count for only 15 seconds. Multiply that by four to get the maximum heart rate that was reached during the exercise. Now, the heart rate starts falling after the exercise and therefore, uh, one can also add to what we have discussed so far, the heart rate recovery test. The principle is that uh, over the next one or two minutes after vigorous exercise, the heart rate starts falling starts coming back to the resting level. And for that, again, there's a proper uh, sort of a test. The heart rate recovery test accounts the pulse rate for 15 seconds at the end of the exercise, as we saw earlier. Suppose it is 135. Now, note this down, but then continue counting the pulse for uh, pulse and count the pulse rate at the end of two minutes after the end of the exercise. Suppose at the end of two minutes, it is 90. So from 135, it has fallen to 90. In this case, the difference between this 135 and 90 is 45. That is a red flag because this difference should be 55 or more in a healthy person. This red flag means that the heart rate is taking much longer to come back to the resting level. That itself is a red flag, and uh, which means that probably one needs uh, a checkup and also perhaps 
a reduction in the intensity of exercise. Now, all this requires uh, measuring the pulse rate. How does one measure the pulse rate? Um, if a person is right-handed and has a wrist watch on the left wrist, what one can do is to place uh, the uh, index finger and the middle finger on the pulse of the right hand. So the, the person has the watch in front of him while doing so, watch in the left hand, and uh, place these two fingers on the pulse, which is on the side of the arm, which is on which we have the thumb. On that side, one finds a bit of a groove at the that end of the arm, and one can feel the pulse there. Now, sometimes there's a tendency to press the fingers too hard so that one can feel the pulse. In fact, one has to place the fingers very gently, and uh, that's enough to be able to feel the pulse. One may say, well, anyway, it's all so cumbersome. Do I have to measure the pulse rate at all? Do I have to get into all, all those equations and formulae? There is a way out, although not as accurate, but I love it, and that is the walk and talk test. You should be able to carry out a conversation comfortably by walking. If you start getting breathless while talking during the walk, then you have probably exceeded your limits. So that tells you how much exercise is safe for you you should be able to carry out a conversation comfortably while walking. But then for that, one needs a companion. Uh, if a companion is not there, sometimes people talk these days loudly while walking, holding a smartphone. Uh, that's okay if you are walking in a lonely area because firstly, you will not disturb anybody uh, while doing that. So that can be a way of administering yourself a walk and talk test. Uh, but then no matter how, or you can start chanting something without the phone, chanting loudly. If you can continue the chant while walking, then again, uh, you passed the test. But then if a person gets breathless uh, while walking or chanting or talking, while talking or chanting during the walk, then it's an indication that the person has reached one's limits. <clears throat> Now, this may give an idea that um, impression that there is a certain limit for each individual and uh, that the person can start at any stage. But if the person is starting an exercise, uh, put in, introducing exercise into his daily routine after a long period of sedentary life, then one should build up slowly. One may start with much lighter exercise than what has been prescribed for 10 to 20 minutes a day instead of 30 minutes a day. And uh, the duration and intensity can both be increased a bit it every fortnight so that the person can reach the 30 or 40 minutes of moderate exercise as prescribed uh, every day to reach that level the person can take up to three months now, exercise for the elderly this needs a little more attention because the elderly in general need a longer warm-up and also a longer cooling down, down period at warm up before they start the real exercise which has been prescribed and a longer cooling down period that is sitting down and resting after the exercise. Both these are should be longer in case of the elderly. Secondly, the elderly should for the elderly, the uh, aerobic exercise should be walking, not jogging. No running, only walking. And uh, also avoid walking in hilly terrains because climbing up a slope, even if it's only walking and not running, can become even more strenuous than running. Yogic postures are good for the elderly, but again, a little precautions may be necessary. Similar exercise, uh, similar ones like say longer warm up, and sitting and lying down postures are preferred to standing postures. Surya Namaskar particularly should be avoided because one or the other contraindication to Surya Namaskar is likely to be present in a large number of the elderly. So unless the person is really healthy and uh, uh, has been cleared by the doctor, one can avoid Surya Namaskar, whether it's heart disease or whether it's back pain, any of these can become a contraindication for Surya Namaskar and no inverted postures. That's a blanket sort of a uh, statement, no inverted postures. And uh, even in semi-inverted postures like Viprit Karani, uh, one should not hesitate taking wall support. Then exercise at the workplace. Yes, it can be done, 
even in sedentary occupations. Find an excuse to get up and walk around a bit once an hour or so. Uh, like say, standing and walking while talking on the phone. So pace up and down your room, your office, and uh, you can stand. Uh, you can uh, stand or walk around, pace up and down your room while talking on the phone instead of talking while sitting. Uh, getting up to see off a visitor, both courteous as well as gives you a chance to uh, get off your chair and go walk up to the door. Uh, walk up to a colleague or to talk instead of using the alternate. Alternatives could be making a phone call, sending an email, sending a message. Uh, but uh, if on one hand, a physical one-to-one -one conversation has no substitute. On the other hand, gives you a chance to just get up from the seat, go there. And if you happen to be the boss, he'll be very happy. Uh, what a polite boss. Instead of calling me to his room, he came to my room. So walk up to a colleague to talk instead of using the alternatives. Then for the back and the neck, again, if the person particularly has a problem, and even if the person has no problem, uh, in sedentary occupations, neck pain and back pain are both quite likely. Apart from using a proper ergonomically designed seat and being in good posture, it is also good to get off the chair uh, and change the posture. And also some of these exercises, particularly neck exercises, can be done even in the office sitting in the chair and even back exercises uh, most of the time work involves forward bending so a little gentle backward bending holding the posture there and coming back and one can further enhance its efficacy inhale while going back bending backwards exhale and chant while coming back that helps then rest the eyes again too much computer work can uh, mean that this uh, eyes also needs rest. And during these breaks, one can couple walking around a bit with resting the eyes by looking outside the window, looking at a distance, uh, particularly if one has a good view of greenery, look at that. Uh, and of course, one can go for more specific things like palming, that is sitting down with the eyes closed, with the cupped palms in front of the eyes. Uh, one can also take some eye exercises sitting in the chair. Then, you know, for uh, uh, relaxation, that is for relieving stress, there's an instant relaxation technique devised by Swami Vivekananda uh, Yoga Anusandhan Sansthan, Svyasa at Bangalore. It's called the instant relaxation technique or IRT. And that consists of sitting in the chair and then uh, stretching oneself and then contracting as strongly as one can different parts of the body moving from the toes upwards. When you move upwards, the part which you had contracted earlier still remains contracted. So contract your toes and your feet and your ankles and the calf muscles and the thigh muscles and the back and the chest as, and uh, in the fists and the arms and then the head and neck, which is the most important. Stay like that for a while and then let go instantly all over everywhere. So that's instant relaxation technique. So making your body very tense to start with and then let go. Like, you know, filling up a balloon and, and then just puncturing it. Yeah. Is it good to take an after dinner walk? Uh, it's considered something that must be very healthy and that's how it has been uh, passed on even in the form of a proverb. Uh, after lunch, rest a while, after dinner, walk a while, and so on. Uh, well, in general, there's a contradiction between uh, the time immediately after a meal and exercise in case of any meal. Because after a meal, the blood flow to the stomach and intestines increases. That's how digestion can take place. And we don't have to do anything about it. It happens automatically. During exercise, the blood flows more blood flows to the excess, uh, to the muscles which are exercising. Again, for that, we don't have to do anything. It happens automatically. Now, if uh, the blood flow increases in the stomach and intestines and also in a large number of muscles simultaneously as a result of this exercise being soon after the meal, then you are increasing the demand on the heart because additional blood has to flow into two major areas of the body 
vascular beds as it is called. So in these two uh, pipe works, major pipe works of the body, in the stomach and intestine and the muscles, additional blood is flowing simultaneously. So naturally the pump has to work harder, then only it's possible. Pump is the heart, the heart has to work harder, it increases the load on the heart. So certainly those who have heart disease should not be taking any exercise immediately after the meal. But then uh, an after dinner walk, a leisurely slow walk is okay for the young and healthy if the weather is moderate because weather can also create a contradiction. If it is hot weather, that will increase the blood flow also to the skin. So a third area in which more blood has to flow. Secondly, exercise will generate heat which may become difficult to get rid of. Uh, in hot weather. And if the weather is very cold, sudden exposure can induce spasm of the coronary arteries, which can lead to a heart attack. So all these possibilities exist. But all the same, in moderate weather, for the young and healthy, a social walk is okay, especially for social reasons. Because that may be the only time when, uh, say, a young couple and a few children that they have are able to spend some time and uh, have a leisurely chat talking to each other. So uh, eating together for a while and then going for a post-dinner walk, that may be important for uh, good harmonious relationships within the family or amongst a group of friends. So for these social reasons, yes, this is okay because for most young and healthy people, uh, this, a light dinner followed by a slow leisurely walk, not a brisk walk, does not create the contradiction of the type that will be Risky. How about exercise in the hills? People often go to the hill station. And they think, since I come on a vacation, this is the time when I can make up for all my sedentary life. But the person is more likely to go grow breathless in the hills than in the plains because the atmospheric pressure is low. And therefore, in fact, the intensity of the exercise might have to be reduced rather than increased when the person is exercising in the hills. Uh, this material is based on uh, uh, the fifth chapter, which is a roughly 20-page chapter in this book, Back to Health Through Yoga, which was published by Rupa Books in 2008, still continues to be in demand, still continues to be in print, available both in print and as an e-book on Amazon. It's also available as, an, as a print book on Amazon. So through Amazon, one can get both an e-book or a printed book. Uh, this is uh, the inside view of Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch, a picture postcard view. Uh, and uh, after COVID, quite some time now, the ashram has resumed its normal activities. And we are also having guests, provision for guests to stay. So you're most welcome. If you have any questions based on what we have talked today, uh, there may be a few minutes now, but even otherwise, you can always send them through an email to yes at yesspirituality.com. Gratitude to the mother and Sri Aurobindo for making these sessions possible. And thank you all for being there.